Hey guys, I'm Ted and welcome back to our lecture series. Uh, for today's lecture, we are going to discuss the progressive era. Uh, a very uh, broad, broad movement, broad, broad era. Um, but before we begin that, I'd like to do our customary recap and just touch bases a little um, what we discussed in our last lecture. So in our last lecture, we wrapped up our look at uh, laissez-faire, um, really the laissez-faire court of the United States. Um, we looked at uh, the Chief Justices Morrison Wade and Stephen Fuller. Um, Fuller was an arc conservative. Uh, he was sort of the, um, the, the the leader, the ringleader of that conservative um, corporate lawyer. Uh, cabal or not, um, really they were just the, the majority on the court um, after uh, after the uh, the presidency of Benjamin Harrison there were that five justice uh, majority on the court that sort of held sway on the court. Um, we, uh, we also looked at the cases of 1895 those uh, three cases that really sort of uh, illustrated that uh, conservative corporate corporate uh, majority flexing its judicial muscle and, and handing out cases and, and the most notable of them all of course being the Debs appeal. Eugene Debs uh, who had been convicted and sentenced to two years in prison following um, following his arrest uh, during the, the, the Pullman strike. Debs, uh, Debs uh, went to jail, he appealed and the Supreme Court unanimously upheld his conviction. Um, and, and it led to uh, widespread claims of um, of corruption and, and and widespread appeals for judicial um, judicial impeachment. Uh, they many many believe that the Supreme Court had gone too far with the uh, with the nine Debs appeal, especially unanimously. Um, and uh, and th that is the environment that we turn to now when we when we uh, look at the progressive era and really. Um, and really, really, we're going to discuss uh, three topics in this lecture. One is going to be uh, the life and presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, um, the progressive era itself, and the term progressism. And progressism, to, be, to, to begin, uh, progressism is the general name for the reform movement of the early 20th century. Now, the progressive reformers tried to increase honesty and efficiency in government and business um, to devolve the great monopolies. Uh, they wanted to Americanize the immigrants and, of course, to substitute rationale and scientific method for the ad hoc and traditional methods then in practice. Um, the, the progressive reformers, they were really picking up, um, picking up the, the mess that had been left in the wake of the uh, populist collapse in 1896, um, the, the the mess of the of the mass arrival of immigrants and the process of uh, Americanization, the political machines in the in the cities, uh, the the urban sprawl, the uh, the dis the dislo the uh, dislocation in general, sort of uh, anarchic like scenes of the uh, of the other cities that they expanded. Um, Really, everything that we've been discussing, um, the the labor and the capital issues, um, those civil rights cases, uh, civil rights in general, the women's movement, all of these cases, all of these issues that we've been discussing, the progressives came in, picked up, and began to push forward. They, they began to push all of that forward. Um, now, and... and uh, and now uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt was uh, the vice president for William McKinley, and he succeeded William McKinley as president in 1901. Um, and Roosevelt, Roosevelt was really the first president to embrace progressivism. He was really the first president to embrace any of these uh, social movements. No president had really embraced uh, um, populism. No president had embraced. Uh, the on uh, the women's movement, uh, temperance, or anything like that. No president really embraced any of these social movements, um, but Roosevelt came in and he embraced this social movement. He embraced po um, progressism uh, and became perhaps the most noted uh, and respected of all the populist figures. Um, Roosevelt, 
was a uh, reformer from New York. He had been a part of uh, the New York City reform movement and advocated what he called the strenuous life. Uh, he maintained a ranch in uh, the Badlands of Dakota, of the, of the Dakotas. Um, he was a war veteran known for his command of the Rough Rider unit during the Spanish-American War. Uh, Roosevelt also initiated the presidential president of presenting legislative programs. And one of the hallmarks of Roosevelt's presidency included what we, what we now uh, call trust busting. Um, and this trust busting campaign and the National Park Service were, were, were really what he's known for, really what he's remembered for politically. Um, he, he looms larger than life in the uh, American thought and American memory because of his larger than life uh, persona that he projected to the public. Um, Roosevelt also created the template for increasing the power of the federal government over the states, um, a, a template that his successors would, uh, would, would use um, one by one. Um, namely, his, uh, namely, his immediate, one of his immediate successors, um, Woodrow Wilson, he would use this to push through legislation um, on his own. Now, progressism was the republic's first urban-based reform movement. All of the previous reform movements have been based in uh, the countryside and they tended to be supported mainly from the countryside. Populism was the last major reform movement to emerge from the countryside. From now on, in the United States, all major reform movements would originate from the cities. Uh, there was this, um, there, there, there was then and still uh, this existing controversy over who was a progressive and who was not a progressive? Uh, who was who was a, who was a reformer? Who wasn't a reformer? And, uh, and and what the progressives even stood for? Now this is because did this controversy exist? Because by 1912, every major political candidate claimed to be a progressive, claimed to be a progressive candidate, and claimed to be the most progressive choice uh, for for voters. Progressism bespoke a collective atmosphere of anticipation that things were going to improve greatly in the republic. Um, there, there was a large amount of confidence that the right thing was going to be done uh, in the wake of the troubles of the uh, of the late 19th century, the 1880s to the 1890s. All of the uh, er everything coming together from the populist movement. The, uh, the urban industrial workers uh, uh, strikes and so forth, all of their calamities, um, those those civil rights cases, uh, the civil rights the civil rights cases of the uh, of the uh, 19th century, the laissez faire court decisions of the 19th century, um, the growth of cities, all the immigration problems and so forth, uh, everything associated with laissez faire, all of these things were going to be addressed. All of these things were going to all of these problems were going to be solved. And solved properly. Um, uh, that that was the, uh, the the going confident. That that was the confident people had in this movement. That was the the confident people had in the people uh, leading this movement. Now, uh, the major proponents of the progressive movement were businessmen, uh, members of the emerging white collar professions, uh, persons such as doctors, accountants, clergymen, teachers. Um, they brought in the rhetoric of the urbanites, of, of the city dwellers, uh, being vastly superior to the hayseed rural inhabitants. Uh, a dramatic reversal from previous rhetoric going back to the Democratic-Republican opposition to the Federalist. It was the, back then, uh, it was the virtuous human farmer who knew how to, uh, who knew what, what was best for the Republic rather than the moneyed class of the uh, of the city but rather than those bankers and those merchants and whatnot uh and other urban professionals um that that's not the case at this point in the night in the early 20th century um the urban the urban professionals the urban upper uh um the the urban uh white collar professional knew what was best for the country and they were going to lead this movement now uh, there, there are a number of competing theories on why the progressive leaders launched their campaign. Uh, and, and these theories range from fears relating to the loss of status, uh, to public officials, uh, wanting to, uh, retake power 
and community leaders seizing an opportunity to expand their civic roles and authority. Um, and there are pros and cons to both arguments. Uh, one group that were particularly active in the progressive movement were the Anglo-Saxons, who by participating in this movement, it is argued, reasserted their dominant uh, or, or their um, prominent role in national affairs after being challenged in some areas and in some cases eclipsed by the new immigrants and by uh and, and by uh other other groups coming in other immigrant other uh, ethnic groups um ethnic minorities such as african americans who had long since been here um and uh and and, uh, and and largely movements that they could not identify with, like um, like uh, the women's movement or the uh, the laissez faire, uh, the emphasis for laissez faire, uh, pro business poli policies, or or even the uh, the populist um, push. You know, they, they they think that they could not identify with the socialists and so forth, groups that they could not identify with, just with their uh, way of simply striking out and and reasserting themselves. Now, religious leaders like Walter Rosenbusch uh, and Washington Gladden advocated what became known as the social gospel, uh, while our, our old thing Jane Adams of Hull House in Chicago um, advocated the, the same thing, the social gospel. Um, honest government proponents were critical of city bosses and their political machines, like uh, Boss Tweed of New York City's Tammany Hall, Lincoln Stephens in particular was critical of uh, Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall. Um, they began to, uh, to speak of bringing in efficiency uh, and, and spoke of efficiency often and, and the use of highly trained technical experts in particular jobs. They advocated civil service exams for positions and the use of appointed executive officers rather than elected uh, city officials uh, who could be out of office in the turn of an election. Now that being said, they were in favor of them of uh, democracy and actively sought to infuse more democracy into society. Uh, they were very afraid of of a uh, of, of waking up and finding themselves governed by a plutocracy uh, that is the rule that 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 is ruled by the very rich, uh, and to ensure uh, to ensure that the very wealthy did not establish a plutocracy over them, they advocated for the direct election of federal senators. Since the founding of the Republic, federal senators had been uh, selected by the state legislatures. They also called for the recall of elected officials. That is, allowing voters to petition and decide if an, if an uh, elected official um, who acted contrary to their desires could be removed from office. Now, these same ideas uh, to introduce a new era of democracy into, uh, into the government also had the potential to be used to undermine democracy, and we'll, we'll examine that a little later. Now, one of the most unsavory aspects of the progressive era and of the progressive movement in and of itself was the principles of racial supremacy, uh, supremacy that predominated the thinking of many of the members of this movement. Racial hygienists and proponents of eugenics, uh, that, that is the breeding of a superior race while suppressing other races as much as possible, thrived, um, lost for sterilization or incarcerating those deemed feeble-minded or lacking in good quality proliferated at this time. Um, the institution of immigrant restrictions and IQ tests were also a part of the progressive agenda. Racial segregation intensified under the progressive era, particularly under Woodrow Wilson, who introduced Jim Crow into branches of the federal government uh, that, it, that it had never been introduced to before during his tenure in office. Now, uh, Theodore Roosevelt embodied many of the aspects of early progressism. Uh, he was born in 1858. Uh, he died in 1919. It was uh, a continual source of a disappointment for him throughout his life that he had been too young to participate in the Civil War. And, and really, if, uh, if, if, he, uh, if, he, if he were able, if he had been able to go off and join, had the drummer boy or, or lie about his age and, 
and somehow fight in the Civil War, he was a very sickly youth. Um, there was there would have been no way for him to uh, had, he, had even contemplate going out to fight. He was a very sickly boy, um, suffering from a multitude of illnesses. So so it, and never so uh, even if he um, even if he uh, had been able to somehow sneak out and join, his illnesses would have uh, you know just disqualified him off the top from going off to fight uh, during the Civil War. Even if he had been able to just sneak out and, and find a sympathetic, uh, some somebody sympathetic enough to let him go on um, and, and fight too. Um, a, uh, a, a, a succession of life-threatening illnesses um, of, afflicted him. But through, through uh, what, what is often cited as sheer determination of will, he was able to overcome his physical weaknesses. Uh, and, and starting at age 16, he started taking boxing lessons. He became a uh, calisthenics enthusiast. He called uh, he called this the strenuous life, and he credited it with making him strong enough to withstand the rigors of life. Roosevelt was a prolific writer and wrote at great detail about the uh, the manliness, which um, incidentally was. Uh, what well, was this higher form of of a uh, prey? But he wrote about the manliness with which he he approached life, and the manliness with which he appreciated the way others approached life. It's if you ever read his um his writings, whenever manliness comes into play, whenever you see the word, whenever it's referenced, it's him offering his highest form of praise. Oh, so that that's just a little bit of an insight into Theodore Roosevelt's thinking. Um, but but it uh. But uh, but but he feared, uh, he feared he was living in an era of, of softness, um, where where men were becoming increasingly effeminate due to the easygoing nature of life. Um, dawn were the hardships of the frontier life, replaced by the luxury and new technologies of of this new uh, post frontier era. Now Theodore Roosevelt, uh, he went to Harvard. Um, he was a member of the upper crust of New York society. He had been born into great wealth and privilege. Um, unlike most men of his class and background, Roosevelt thought it was his duty to get involved into politics, uh, particularly state politics, and to combat political machines and corruption. Um, now, now Roosevelt, uh, and the name itself, Roosevelt, is Dutch. He was a member of that old uh, Dutch um, settler class, that, that old Dutch settler base, that we discussed uh, way back in the beginning when we first talked about colonialism, how the uh, the Dutch settled in New Amsterdam that became New York, and they handed out uh, estates and um, and property to uh, to those who came over. They did the the uh, patroon ships. After the uh, patroon title and so forth fell out of um, fell out of uh, favor, fell 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 out of fashion. The uh, the the, uh, the people who still held the estates, who still held the land. They still um, grew. Uh, they they still maintain their position, their status, their wealth by uh, by, by by simply um, you know uh, by by simply being landowners. In some cases, selling it into uh, selling it to real estate developers, developers developing it themselves, um, largely just subsisting uh, like like that. And that's the class that Roosevelt was born into. That is the family. That Roosevelt, that was uh, one of the families that Roosevelt was born into. Um, so very wealthy, uh, very very set for life, um, and and men, uh, wealthy men of his age, did not engage in politics. They they did. Uh, this isn't like uh, ancient Rome where you acquire wealth and you enter politics. Uh, these men had wealth and they had no desire to enter politics or to be a part of politics or anything like that. Um, Roosevelt, uh, he thought it was his duty. And he faced opposition uh, from his close friends and and and, uh, and, and close associates, uh, who warned him that there were no gentlemen in politics, only low class laborers. Um, and and and, uh, and Roosevelt, you know, he chided his friends. He called them weak men, who, even though they had been given all the opportunities of birth and the advantage of class, had allowed lower class men to become their rulers. Uh, so Roosevelt, undaunted. Uh, set off on a political career, and he was elected to the New York State Assembly in 1882. Uh, and though he was a uh, proponent of manliness, he dressed in, in, uh, in what we uh, what we term a very dandy-like fashion. He was a dandy, 
and uh, he caused a great stir when he first arrived at the uh, New York State um, uh, Assembly, um, and he was greeted with laughter uh, for his appearance, but he won over many supporters and proved to be a force to be reckoned with in New York State politics. Now, most politicians in the 19th century had to undergo an apprenticeship of sorts. Um, uh, they had to build up enough social and political capital to gain widespread community recognition. Uh, Roosevelt didn't have to do that. Roosevelt never had to go through that step, uh, that, that phase of, um, of, uh, of, of his career. Um, everybody in New York State knew he came from a very old and very well-to-do and well-known Dutch family. Um, everyone knew that he was an unusual person to be in politics at the time. Roosevelt, realizing the opportunity, made the most of his status uh, to acquaint New Yorkers with himself. He was one of the uh, the first politicians to really use the media, um, and, and to him, uh, to, to him, this was simply a, a way for him to maximize his exposure. Roosevelt um, also served as the police commissioner of New York City and led the urban reform campaign to uh, to end corruption, earning him the resentment of the political bosses in the process. Now Roosevelt's uh, career was almost cut short when a series of personal tragedies in 1884 sent him into a temporary retreat from, uh, from public life. Um, on the very same day, his wife Alice died. Um, she, she died after childbirth. She died of, um, of, of illness after childbirth. Uh, and on the very same day, his mother died. So the two most important people in his life, the two most important women in his life, both died on the same day. He was bereft. He retreated to uh, the bad. He retreated to um, Elkhorn, his uh, his ranch in the Badlands, and he um, uh, he, he went through a, a, a very difficult, a very trying time, a very uh, depressive episode in his life. Um, we'll break here, and it's kind of a a, a a depressive note to end on. But we'll break here. Um, hit like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what you thought about our lecture so far. Um, always curious to hear your feedback. I'm Ted, and I'll see you guys next time for part two of our lecture on progressivism and the progressive era.